I don't know if you can see, but I do like to get underneath this little flap and then I still start with tiny little stitches and then I'll draw around and see how it goes. I'm going to try to go small. What I'm doing is practicing a variation on the bird's nest, string of bird's nest stitch that I showed you in the stitch patterns video. And I haven't done it in a while. I'll show it to you on one of my big bloom flowers if I can find something that I can get a close up to really show you that. I don't have one, but I have pictures of most of them. Um, you know, scattered all over my hard drives. And so, um, you do the bird's nest, but you don't overlap, and you turn it into a point, and then you come back and make it so it's a shape you can cut out, but I like them to be in masses. So I'll do like two together, and then maybe come and do one over here, and then just kind of maybe break into some other kind of stitching. And then this is the shape I would cut out and leave on the flower petal. And these are small enough. Where's one you can see? These are small enough that I'll try to quilt small, but I'm imagining that I'll leave between three and I don't think I could fit seven on there, really. Um, three to six, possibly seven. I don't want to leave all of it because I do want to have some stitching that is just in what I'm calling my dark brick fabric. And, you know, I'm wanting to obscure the pattern of the fabric as I go. And so, um, and when I'm quilting, I'm going to make an effort to stay on the batting so that I'm actually quilting through a, a quilt sandwich that has three layers of fabric and one layer of batting when I do the hot pink. So I probably won't push my margins too much. I'm just going to try to stay aware of where the batting is. And I can a little bit tug that, you know, but I don't want to, I don't want to actually contort my piece. But I can kind of stay aware of where the batting is and try to stay on top of it. And that's what I'm going to do. Pretty tiny, all right. I've learned if I stitch to the very edge of a trimmed edge, it's going to fray off there anyway, and I can pick it off with my scissors when I trim, so I'm just going to go through there. And I just like to find a place to die into there. I'm just going to hop over here. I had a cut there, and I didn't really want to just go through that, so I'm going to start back up over here, and I'm just going to pull back the fabric and start right. So we'll see, maybe we won't like it. They seem to all turn out pretty similar. Once I have this flower stitched on all five petals, I go back and do a little outlining on three of the five petals so I have some nice voids to trim off. And I like to leave a double line of stitching. In one of these, I only left one line, and I do actually go back and add a second line of stitching before I trim that. Here I am going on the petals in a basic uh, counterclockwise direction, doing the petals moving from one to the next, going counterclockwise. And this just kind of forces the stitches to be varied from flower to flower. I just don't like things to look too much the same. I like it to look, you know, not like a machine sewed it or a robot, but like a human being who was aware of stitch quality and the form and flow of what they were doing uh, made this with attention to the details as they went along. Where I have an opportunity to cut in and open it up, I'm going to do that, but I try to look down and make sure I'm not going to get into trouble where I can only leave one little row of stitching or something like that. And where the stitching is uh, too close to get rid between them, I'll go up to that area and then pick up on the other side. So 
so I try to adhere to that rule of leaving at least an eighth, even if something's not continuous, even if the where I clipped isn't continuous. So I'm going to pick through, and you have to be real careful to just get through one layer. If I exposed all the way down to batting, I would have to figure out a way to fix that. I have experimented a little bit with having some exposed batting, and it's okay. It's not my... I never really did uh, stick with that. It just wasn't... Although you can do some cool things, you know, you can stitch in the exposed batting, you can, uh, in some way, colorize that. And I don't know if I should, I'm thinking of trimming out here, but I'm worried that this color is so close to that color, the, the burgundy, or cr the cranberry fabric is so close in color to this, what I'm calling a, you know, brick or something. I'm worried that it will just make that look weird. It'd probably be fine. But so you're thinking about that all the time. Should I cut this out? Should I not cut this out? Will this give me some nice variation? That's all we're going for, is some nice variation in our petal. And this is my habitual stitch. Um, You guys will find things that you you like to stitch. I like to stitch stuff that I think looks neat and I, I know I can keep doing it. I think that's enough. I I but I rather like that. Okay, I don't do this a ton, but sometimes there's something and I wanted to trim this and so I'm going to add a line of stitching and I'm just going to start up over top of the line that's there because to me that's acceptable for two areas to die into each other and so I'm going to start up through there and I'm just going to come down along here so that I can trim out the inside part. And I die into the other side. So, and then I'm just going to trim this out here. And I just wouldn't have felt right, even with the tiny stitching, leaving that there if I didn't have two rows of stitching. I occasionally very there's one little spot on one of these where I have a short area that's one row of stitching, but for the most part, it's a rule that I follow. Okay, so now I have these three. One of my... Uh, flowers has an area that's much much lighter which is okay with me but I could have planned to not include that if I wanted and so you can do that you can kind of fussy cut your stuff I'm gonna stitch around this a bit but I don't have a ton of batting and so I'm gonna go up pretty close in these areas because it really does change the look when you fall off the batting and my batting goes all the way up there, so I'm going to stitch up real close in these corners and then just come around. And there will only be a few places where I double and triple up my line of white. I want to leave a nice margin for sewing on the flower. I'll just pick a place to start, and I tend to double back to it immediately so that it's not just a line starting up. I like it to be a closed shape whether it's a little circle or just a place that I went back up to. So I've got a lot of batting right here. You can go clockwise or counterclockwise. I kind of do a seesawing where I go back and forth and back and forth, but I'm generally going one, one way. I forgot to put my bobbins in the last video, but that's actually number 10. That's one of the problems with shooting so much and then make, trying to make the video as short as I can and still include everything. Okay, so here I'm just gonna stitch over top of where I ran out and the new stitches I'm gonna 
make an effort to make them little tiny stitches where they stitch up over the top. And I can see that I have almost no batting on this side. So I'm really just going to come around and then I'll do a little bit there where I do have some. And then I do like to hop around on here and go in some of these cutouts. And when we get here, this is one of these spots where I can just stitch down this row because it's going to fray off both sides because I'm really even though I'll go over through all this and I'll catch some of this in the wash and everything else it's going to pull off and I can pull it off with my scissors when I trim that's what I was talking about if you didn't catch that and so I'm going to hop in and around my piece and do those. I just think they look more interesting if they have a little stitching in them. So this narrow kind of area is a part where I would leave one row of stitching sometimes. When I hop, I need to make sure that my bobbin thread when I move is disengaged from the internal mechanism or it'll just make a rat's nest under there. This is the kind of thing where I could give you a lot of specific little instructions and ideas, but I think you just learn by doing this. You make one or two and you see what you really like the most and then you start doing them all that way. And so this is basically what I'm doing. I've never made the flower exactly like this, but I'm still just stitching it as fast as I can. I'm really enjoying how easy it is to move this little piece around and when it's done I'll see if I feel like I've gained a lot with this new method or if I've lost as much as I've gained. So you can see on my back that I have some unsightly thread pile ups where I was doing my starburst and I was hitting those plastic discs. The rest of this is pretty good. There are a few spots that aren't perfect, but I didn't even think of this, but by building this on the muslin and putting it down, we are only going to really see what's on this side. And so any problems we have here, uh, we'll want to fix at some point, but, or distract from them or cover them up. But um, on this side, as long as this won't pull out and look bad on the other side, we're not going to worry about it. And what we're going to do here, and you might want to use a little bit bigger scissors since you're trimming batting too, we're just going to come along the back and just without getting too aggressive because we don't want to cut our front petal fabric, we're just going to cut around here and get rid of this extra, the muslin, and the batting. And like I say, because this is a, a layer of batting that I'm cutting, these scissors are not the best thing. I'm going to use bigger scissors and I'm going to be real careful. When I do my next stitching, I'm going to be stitching through the whole piece. So I'll be stitching through a batting layer and three layers of fabric plus this fourth layer and so I really want to get rid of a lot of this and a little side benefit of this I think this batting ending and then being stitched down is going to give some nice depth at this edge and having these little pieces to work on it does make it little so that you've got to you know mind your needle carefully which I hope you're always paying attention to where your needle is and not doing anything that you feel puts you at risk and if you think you're trimming through your petal fabric stop immediately don't just say unless you have a good plan I'll just trim it away all the way just stop because you may have trimmed just a short little area that you could cover with some satin stitching or something and but if you cut it all the way out, you're going to have to deal with this edge of batting that's white everywhere. So here's what I have now. So to water this paint down, I just am going to take some water and just, you 
you know, I really want a fair amount, but if I were to pour some water in here, it would probably be too much. I'm guessing that when I do this, it's about a one-to-one. -one. one part paint, one part water, because I do want it to flow and be easy to apply. So it still has paint-like body. It is not uh, more like water than like paint. It's still more like paint than like water. And I make a snap decision to paint the center of the flower. It looks a lot like a sunny side up egg to me. And for some reason I just want to paint it kind of a light gold color. And then I use the deeper gold in the area that I've been talking about the whole time. And I kind of paint out into the little points and I use a little angle brush that's good for this sort of thing. And I'm leaving the little small shapes between the two areas blank because I'm going to paint in there with a green metallic color. And I do enjoy this work. It's time consuming. Painting these three uh, pieces takes me about 40 minutes. And I would love to do a piece where I just painted as much as I wanted. I could see painting in the burgundy could be a really nice thing to add and it would be nice to paint more around the edge of the starburst but for now I'm gonna stop with this and it is true that when you're making stuff to sell it or to make a video you're just gonna get it done as quick as you can. I get a little bit of this halo blue gold so I decided to see what it would look like if I made some of the kind of changes that I've been thinking about. I've just used green marker to go in here because um, I think this picture's from before I did the green painting. But anyway, uh, I tried painting in here. I'm using a green marker, but I tried marking in here. And what I could tell immediately was that, uh, you know, if the contrast were as much as this, I wouldn't care for it because that's just too big of a jump. Although my green paint, this is pretty washed out on my actual piece, my green paint, you know, would be darker than the color I've been calling my cranberry, but it would, it wouldn't be as drastic as this. But I still don't really like that. I do like this a lot where I'm outlining in the shape that goes around the outside. And that's what I mean when I talk about double outlining things. It gives you a place that you can paint. And I like it where it crosses over itself in a place like this. And then, so you're not doing one solid line around it. You've got a kind of a shape that's got a little bit of interesting uh, visual movement to it as it goes around. And so I'm, I'm liking this. I've colored in here with a yellow highlighter and I like the idea of doing this part and having it not be the same, the fabric there and the fabric there. And just for practical reasons, I don't wanna try to paint that edge that's gonna fray because some will show and some won't and, and I just don't think that that'll work out the best for me. So, as we move down here, I also try doing something bright and orange in this area around the starburst, and I don't care for that either. Even if it were toned down, I just don't like the idea of that having a lot of contrast to the yellow. I would like a subtle amount of differentiation between the areas on my starburst. And then if you come down here, you can see where in this same area where I did the the dark green, I've done a, kind of a red marker that's actually pretty close in some ways to the color that my cranberry fabric is. And I'm liking this approach. If I start to do something and I don't like it, I'll change course right away because this ink isn't permanent at first. Until I heat set this, this will wash out. and. Um, 
I think the more time that passes, the less likely it is to wash out completely. But right now, I think I could get all of this paint out if I wanted to. So, what I'm going to try to do here, and I hope I like it, but if I don't, I can let it dry and then paint over it, is I'm now going to take a little bit of this other color that I used there. And I'm going to put it down there. Because what I want to do is go around the outside part with a little bit of a mixture. And I don't want it to be a uniform mixture. I may have to switch to a smaller brush. See, the reason I thin is because if it's too thick, it just sits on top, which it's kind of doing now. And I like the paint to soak in on contact a little bit. So I'm going to get a little more water. I just want it to soak in a little faster. Alright, so then the big decision is next. What do I do out here? I really like that green line. Really liked it. So I think I'm going to do that. And then if that's enough and I just am like, oh, I really I love it, then I'm, I'll stop. I'm going to use my gold paint that that's already in the area to really thin that down. See how much less intense it is? And then I'm going to go around that outside and see what I think. And sometimes you just have to decide uh, how to paint it because sometimes there isn't really a, a line where you want your paint to go. And so you can just paint, uh, I like to say, along imaginary lines in those areas so that the shape that you want is there. And I feel that the paint is strong enough to carry that. So I'm mixing together this orange and this metallic russet. And I have to say, you know, I I let my daughter use my paints sometimes and I have a bunch of dried out colors. So that's not that's not anything. The only one that I really like enough to go to the trouble to do it, I think is this one where I put a lot of the gold in it. I want to keep it on the orangey side though. Yeah, something like that. So I'm going to see if I'm just going to start doing it and see if I like it. And I think I've said it before, but I just want to make it clear that I use the paints I use because when I wanted to start learning to paint on fabric, these are the ones that I decided to use. And I like them so I haven't moved on. Um, so I haven't tried a ton of different kinds, even within the, the brand that I use, I haven't tried every product. I do think that anything that you can heat set that you like the look of it on your piece is going to work and I do think that craft paints will work and that you can use an extender with those. They might be stiffer but I'm not sure that stiffness is an issue here. This isn't a scarf or something. This is a, a wall piece and it could be I think at a certain point crunchy enough that it was a turn off to you but I do think that you have some room with that and so there's nothing uh, there's nothing about the paints I'm using that that I wouldn't want you to overlook paints you already have that are paid for to buy to buy more uh, thinking that I'm using the best thing there is on the market. I'm just using what I have. And so here's what I have when I'm finally done. I it could be worse. I think I like them. I, I'll see once I put them on the 
larger piece next time. First do some steps. I'm going to first do some satin stitching and then attach them and then do some more satin stitching and then uh, we should be on our way and we'll do some of our leaf stitching before the flower and some after. Thanks!